Thank you so much for coming on the platform. This is truly an honor. I really appreciate everything that you have done over the years. You put in several decades of work um, to help sharing that, that African history. Um, so we're going to get right into it. For the viewers who may not recognize you, uh, could you let them know who you are and definitely where you're from? Um, yes, it's really an honor for me to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm a professor of the history of African art and architecture, and I teach at Harvard University. And um, I, I just think that the world on a whole doesn't know the history of Africa, even in Africa, and the incredible significance and stunning beauty of its many arts. And so that's my passion and that's my profession. Wow, that's amazing. Um, now I can ask you this, when did you develop an interest in art? Uh, in art per se, I think that goes back early. Um, I was always interested in, in making art in some form or another from, from when I was young. And then I became really interested in looking at art and understanding its history and began to realize that you can really look at and through art to understand the history of a period and um, the larger questions of not only artists, but also subjects of, of various works of art and how people are seeing them in that time period. So it was an amazing lens um, to understand the world. And so at a certain point, I decided to um, move in that direction as opposed to creating artworks myself. Okay, okay. Now I can ask you, um, when did you actually uh, develop a passion for African art in particular? Was it around the same time or did that kind of come later? Yeah, that, that came later. I was working uh, the summer after my freshman year in Washington, D.C. Um, I was working at the U.S. Senate and that was a really hot year in, in D.C. with a lot of um, riots and tear gas. It was just, it was a tough summer. And I was living right uh, in, uh, in downtown. And that was the summer that Bobby Kennedy was killed. And uh, I saw the hearse go by where I was living. And uh, that was, you know, the third of three really powerful, horrendous uh, deaths. And so when I went back home, I'm from Vermont, and I went back home um, to uh, take up my sophomore year at the University of Vermont and then decided I really needed to do something more important with my life, more, more salient, more um, in, in keeping with the times. And so I quit school after my sophomore year and went to Africa in the Peace Corps. And that experience transformed me. I was At the time, I wasn't looking at art at all. I was working on projects to dig wells and build schools and promote local forms of agriculture. Um, but I just, I love the culture where I was living. I was living in a Yoruba culture and what was then Dahomey and is now the Republic of Benin. Wow, that sounds amazing. Now I can ask you this, um, now how did your family feel about you traveling to Africa, especially back then? This is like you say, 1960s. Well, um, it was a little bit more complicated than that because uh, I was dating someone uh, and of a different religion. Uh, I grew up Protestant. He was Catholic and um, he was interested in going to Africa. And it was in part through him or actually he was interested in going to the Peace Corps. He had, you know, at that point it was difficult to get in. And um, it was kind of in conjunction with that. I said, well, um, maybe I'll just go with you. And, uh, but we couldn't do that at the time uh, and be assigned to the same place unless we got married. So, you know, I turned to him, we were sitting in the car and I said, I, I guess we got to get married. And he said, I guess so. And I said, well, I guess we're engaged. And he said, yes. And then we had to tell my parents. So I, from my vantage point, it was the shock that I was quitting school and getting married that probably hit them more than, um, the idea that I was going to Africa. And uh, I think that they, they, they were fine with that. Um, and they came and visited uh, while we were there. And, um, but, and I will say, not, you know, marriage is the luck of the draw or, or relationships and we're still together. So that experience of bonding, um, even though I was pretty young, uh, ended up uh, being a positive one. He's been really 
uh, critical to, to my whole engagement with academics and other things. Wow, that's amazing. That's truly <laughs> amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, now I can ask you, um, like you say, you was doing a lot of work, like digging wells and stuff while you was over there before you kind of got into the art. But what did that experience um, going to Africa do for you? Um, it opened up a world. I just loved it. I just love everything about Africa. And I've, I've done work in a number of places. I love the spirituality, the complexity of the spirituality. Um, Islam, Christianity, indigenous religions, how they all play together. I love the community, the warmth of people. I love, uh, I just love nearly everything about it. And, and when I go, I just feel so much fuller, so much, so much more in life uh, in many respects. And um, so it was, it was just an experience that transformed what I thought was possible in the world. Okay, okay. I wanted to ask you about um, some of the books you wrote. I was looking online and they said you wrote uh, 25 books. Is that correct? I never count. I have no idea. I just, I just love, I just love researching and writing them and then, um, and then they, they come out. Okay. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask you about some of the books in particular. Um, you have a book, uh, the history of African art. Art Essentials, I believe that came out in uh, 2023. Um, if you could talk about what is the process uh, for writing a piece like that? That that that's a, it's a great uh, model to pick up. Um, the field of African art as an as an academic discipline has changed dramatically since I went to graduate school. Um, at that point in time, most of our models came from anthropology, so it was pretty much ahistorical. And increasingly, uh, many of us have pushed more into the area of looking at, at African art historically to actually address the issues um, across time and to reach out beyond the, the, the continent itself to look at Africa and the Americas, Africa and Europe, Africa and Asia. And so that book, fortunately, I knew it was going to be a very small um, or relatively small um, uh, amount of uh, text and images, and and I really wanted to tell the story as history, as chronology. So divided into like ancient Africa, medieval, um, the early modern or Renaissance period, um, colonial period, contemporary period. Um, it took me a couple of years to actually select the images um, because that I knew would be hard. I had about a hundred images, and I wanted them broadly around the continent. Uh, and broadly defined, defined within these periods. And I did that and then I put them in the order that I wanted to write them in and to tell stories around each work. And it covers 150,000 years. So it, it is really deep. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to make it a fun read and to, to make people just kind of drool over the images as much as um, enjoy and be moved by the text, the histories of these places. So the writing of it actually was very went very quickly, and I began in the contemporary chapter. I had nine images and started there, and uh, I worked backwards, uh, and I learned a lot from writing that. I, I got a very different sense of the colonial era, which actually was one of the most creative periods in African art. And if we think about it, it's coming in the aftermath of that really horrific period of international slave trade, which marked the Renaissance in Europe and in Africa was just a period of, of transformative pain uh, and then moved back in time. And, and there were a couple of things I wanted to do uh, that were a little bit controversial. Um, I included the Nile Valley as part of Africa Right. And um, so, of course, that's got its own vast history and engaging the Nile Valley with the rest of Africa. And then I wanted to address North Africa and claiming the Roman period of the Amatsir or what we sometimes the group we sometimes call it Berber within the context of African art, because they were the principal viewers and makers and they were part of, you know, critical uh, founding part of this culture. So it, that one was really fun to do. Wow, wow, that's amazing. 
Um, I guess I kind of wanted to touch on something uh, you mentioned. I can remember being younger. I will never forget this. I was in the library and uh, I forget I asked the librarian something about uh, the books about African history. And she was like, you know, they're over here. And then I was looking and looking and looking. And then she was like, uh, what, are you looking for something in particular? And then I was like, yeah, I'm looking for some books about Egypt. And she was like, oh, that's not over here. She was like, uh, <laughs> that's in the Middle East section. I'm like, Egypt is in Africa, right? And she said, yeah, but it's not over here. So, you know, I just that, wanted to that, ask, uh -huh. that is still in play today. It, it's just plain stunning. And uh, um, I mean, I can tell you, I could tell you, I won't go into it, but a lot of the larger uh, controversies just, just around how we decide to shape the world uh, in ways that that benefit one particular history or one um, population or whatever, but it's it's definitely um, uh, in the heart of Africa and Africa, the rest of the continent is engaging with it. I mean, I was recently at a conference on Nubia, and you can't understand Nubia without really understanding the rest of the continent and how important trade and people and ideas were in relationship uh, between them. I think one of the other things that that I I knew before writing this book, and and it's not a key piece in it, but I think it's important that that most people don't know about Africa um, is that um, the Black Death, which had such a tremendously um, devastating role on Europe and Asia um, around 1348, 1349, killing maybe a third or more of the population also hit Africa, North Africa, the Nile Valley, but also we're finding in the middle of Africa as well. And you can see this through archeological evidence and others. And what happened in Europe at that time, there's a real dearth of labor. And so uh, the population, the workers um, really grew up uh, um, it, at that time and pushed back against the, the feudal lords. And there was a dearth of labor, uh, you know, in part in conjunction with this. So, so the slave trade, the Trans-Saharan developed or grew in part during that period, but it was very different from what happened with the slave trade in the Americas. Um, in Europe, it was one generation, most of the women in the houses and the men in the, in the workshops. And in the Americas, it's basically based on race and in perpetuity. So it's a very, very different phenomenon. And not only does did slavery dehumanize uh, individuals in ways which, you know, they can have no art, they can have no history, no culture, because they're not human, is, is the way it was transformed, even in this period of enlightenment in which these, these differences were engaged. But equally important, it took Europe 100 years to really get over the impacts of the Black Death. And by then, thanks in large measure to Africa, um, there were key new technologies, sciences that were in play coming from um, Islamic um, North and West Africa and elsewhere into Spain and then from there into Europe. So by the time the Europeans are navigating the Portuguese around the coast of West Africa, 100 years later in the 1450s, they're coming in with um, firepower and other things and basically transforming the continent with the um, taking of people who then become enslaved. And so Europe is expanding and Africa is deeply contracting, not only in populations, but on the, the ability to, to, to really engage in this. And I think that a lot of the disparity and the disparagement that we see about Africa, its history, its arts, its civilization, its religions, its culture, Base, is based on the fact of um, that period of industrial revolution in Europe had its sort of counter in the era of enslavement in Africa. And so when the colonial um, uh, groups come in, as painful as that was, at least it um, is associated with the calming of the violence of taking of humans and human life in the context of the international slave trade. Wow. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, okay. My next question is this, um, kind of growing up when we, and even today, when people speak about Africa, they usually kind of generalize it as being one place, but Africa is 
uh, the most genetically diverse continent. It has more countries than any other continent. Um, by you getting a chance to look at the artwork all around Africa, um, did you s still see um, a large level of diversity, say, um, going from Mali to Benin to Nigeria, you know, even in the West African art? There's a, I, how would I answer this? There's a, an enormous amount of diversity, absolutely. I think at the same time, there are a lot of art and cultural and historical elements that cross between different areas and, reg and regions. The rivers played a critical role in, in transforming ideas and bringing ideas in various places. The Niger River, the Congo River, the Nile River valleys um, certainly were important. And when does have that diversity, but I think it's in many respects a, a misstatement when um, one turns to Africa and looks at, a, at one linguistic map or another and sees, you know, thousands and thousands of different languages as if these are all very different populations. And in a sense, it really wouldn't be that much different as looking at the different dialects of French, right, before televisions, when everybody got on board and spoke the same kind of um, set of um, elements around the French language or, or English, for that matter. And so I think that it um, certainly there, there are major differences, religion, um, languages, you know, histories, politics, but I also think that that we we overlook the cultural ways in which many of those uh, are brought together and and continue to be do to to do so, and I, I think the other thing that often gets overlooked it, it, when I was beginning my work on African art, the assumption was that African art was traditional. You know, things that were made in 1920 were identical to those that were made, say, in 1252. Uh, and one of the things that I found uh, and that I that I champion in this book is that African art is some of the most creative works any place in the world. That 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 African artists, you know, are looking to um, really transform what they're looking at in very new and interesting ways. Whether you're talking about contemporary arts, and we're in a golden age of African contemporary arts, or we're talking at some of the more historic forms. Okay, okay. I appreciate you uh, uh, breaking that down. Now, can I ask you, um, over the years, have you, um, I guess, kind of um, developed a favorite? Is there a certain region or a certain type of African art that you love the most or you love them all the same? Uh, that's hard. Um, that's really hard. You know, it, it's like, you know, which is my favorite uh, or whatever it is, my ice cream, favorite ice cream or book or whatever. Um, I love Nigeria. I love Benin. Uh, Mali is extraordinary. Um, Senegal is amazing. Morocco is transformative. Uh, Egypt is uh, just stunning. And Ethiopia, I think every human needs to go to Ethiopia. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just, it, it's it, it's foundational. But And so, so are many of these other areas as well. But I, but I love I, I love them all. But if you know if if I had a plane ticket and and could pick a couple just to drop down in for a few weeks or a few months, uh, those would probably be close to the top. Wow, definitely, definitely, those are uh, some amazing places. I love Ethiopia. I, I can't wait to go back. Yeah, I mean, when I was there, what struck me was. Um, how close the Christianity that's being practiced there is to what I imagine it was uh, in the centuries after the death of, of Jesus, um, a period when Judaism still has a really prominent role. And, and so I see Ethiopian Christianity as, in a way as is sort of rooted in that legacy more than I might see that uh, in Europe. And, and among the other things that, that struck me was, I was talking with somebody about confession and learned that, well, you'd never go to a confession in Ethiopia if you'd actually sinned, right? You have to leave a good life, live a good life. And I'm going like, wow, isn't that the point of confession? You know, you, you do something wrong and then you go and, you know, you ask for, for forgiveness. And so it's that kind of putting into practice your beliefs um, in a way that there I saw and, and just, you know, going to 
Axum and seeing getting up before dawn and seeing the procession of the book, right? And we were we were following along behind the two priests who were carrying the book. I just said, "Wow, this is really this is really quite stunning." Um, and and so I got I got a sense really of a living art of a living religion in ways that certainly are different from what it would have been practiced um, at the time. You know, Christianity is emerging in, in Axum and elsewhere, but um, really important still today. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Um, let me see, we got about 10 minutes uh, left. I wanted to ask you about another uh, project, um, African Vodun Art, Psychology and Power. Um, if you could speak about that project and what, what is the difference between people say Vodun or Voodoo, is that similar? It's, it's the same uh, larger religious uh, context. Um, and um, it was, uh, that was a project. I did my first research up in the North looking at architecture. And I, in the Peace Corps, I'd lived in a Yoruba town called Chabe. And it had been devastated by the military of Dahomey during the wars of enslavement, just destroyed. And, and in part by the uh, women, the female troops, the Agogie. And, and my next project, I was looking for one and decided to go to Dahomey to see if, if I could understand more about it. And, and that was not necessarily the book that I had wanted to write. I was more interested in doing a history, but when you get into these, I'm sure it's like um, writing music, you kind of listen to what, what wants to be said at that, at that moment. And it ended up being a, a book about these objects of empowerment and protection. And, and one of the things I learned in doing that book uh, of looking at these works that were pretty much disparaged uh, as, as dangerous and indeed to make sculptures in the Americas linked to Vodou or anything else was, was absolutely forbidden. But I began to realize that, that Vodou is a, is a religion of spirituality and philosophy of being calm, of waiting before one acts and being thoughtful and thinking about the broader um, circumstances, one's family, one's social setting, the religious, the various deities and the ancestors there for one when you're evaluating the larger context. So uh, it ended up, I think, being successful and transformative in part because I was countering uh, a narrative around that. And um, I think um, Western scholars are, are still today stunned by the su success of Toussaint Louverture, who came from this part of the world in the revolution in Haiti, you know, against the forces of Napoleon. How was that possible? So they say, oh, it must have been voodoo or whatever. Uh, and in fact, you know, it had to do, I think, with just the brilliance of the um, the main political actors there and the philosophy behind how they were engaging uh, in that very difficult world. Oh, okay, okay. Um, now I can ask you this. Um, I guess kind of growing up in school, we kind of uh, learned or we assumed that a lot of uh, the African culture, religion, music, and all those other things were lost, um, you know, after the, the slave trade. Um, now, can you speak about the connection from, you know, West Africa and some of the, I guess, slaves still bringing that culture and art? Is, is some of that still existing today in places like New Orleans or Haiti? Or yeah, Absolutely. And I, the book that I'm, that I'm, or the research that I'm doing now goes from Igbo Uku, which is the medieval Igbo site in Nigeria with really wonderful arts. And I'm addressing that. Um, through some of the contemporary artists, uh, literary artists and visual artists. And then I take it to Igbo Landing, which was the site of that mass suicide in Savannah, Georgia in 1803. And so the part that I've been working on is, is looking at the, the, the context of Savannah and the living legacy of the Igbo and others there. And, and whether it is Harriet Powers and the, the Bible quilt, which actually also has compliments in the Igbo area, or many other things, whether it's language or music, blacksmithing, basket making, all kinds of things, that legacy um, endures to this day. And, and what I found in doing this work is in pinpointing it to here, I'm looking at 
principally one year or the, a year and, and that period around it on, on the plantation life and it for the free blacks uh, and those who are enslaved in Savannah uh, and in Charleston in this period, I can really highlight what is happening and what kinds of things are being carried over and, and engaged with. Um, and I think, I mean, we can't help but note the continuing importance of Africa to this day. I mean, there's no place in the world that's not playing some kind of jazz related music. Uh, and jazz, like many other things, whether it's quilts or otherwise, comes from, from many sources, but the richness of the African um, connections um, are always there. And when one looks at the African-American quilts, among others, and their, their rich complexity and diversity of forms, the, the movement away from symmetry towards abstraction and towards bold colors as opposed to soft pastels, um, you begin to see what, what in, in a true sense, this color um, that Africa's providing um, it, is really making to these traditions and to the, um, the American continent more generally. Yeah, that's very, very important because, like you say, jazz, when I think of jazz, I think of New Orleans, I think of blues, and, you know, a lot of our music come from that area. And then, like you say, even the quilts and the dances and, you know, and so forth, because you, uh, I kind of uh, read about Congo Square and places like that where they were able to maintain a little bit more than maybe some of the other ports where the slaves was brought in. So that, that's definitely important. Um, now, let me see. OK, we about three minutes left. So I guess I just wanted to ask you, um, you said you you going to Brazil. Is that work related or is that just kind of vacation? Um, no, it's it's well, it's how do you say it? it's it's between the two. I'm going with some colleagues from here uh, and we're going with graduate students and faculty and others. And um, I don't consider it work. <laughs> I consider it uh, just a wonderful chance to experience this world. I'd gone with some members of this group to Cuba earlier, and uh, it, uh, it, it these kinds of trips really open your eyes to different uh, parts of the world. I haven't even looked at the itinerary yet, um, and um, uh, but I, I will in a, in a couple of days, and I, I simply can't wait. Wow, that sounds exciting, right? It, 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 it's a dream for most people. So like you say, it's not really work. I, I got a chance. I studied abroad in Brazil. It's a very beautiful country, wow. full of culture, full of music. So it's definitely. But you, you have you been there before or is this your first oh, time? This is my first trip. Oh, wow. OK, well, safe travels. I'm, I'm sure you're going to love the food, the music and everything. I so. can't wait. And thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I want to thank you again so much um, for everything that you contributed and the things that you're currently working on. I definitely look forward to um, those things as well. So I'm going to have to go back and check out um, some more of your books and stuff like that. But I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much, Ty. And thank you so much for all you do. It's it's inspirational. And um, thank you. Thank you. Great. OK, talk soon. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye bye.